Hey everyone, it's Holy Post time. This week we talk about my new book, What If Jesus Was Serious About Heaven? Caitlin interviews me about the book, why popular Christian beliefs about heaven are so often completely unbiblical, and how heaven can actually become an idol that replaces Jesus at the center of our faith. Also this week, we react to the war that's erupted in Israel. Plus, Phil is back from Nashville with some interesting insights about why evangelicals are so bad at comedy, but often so good at anger. Caitlin learns what a hutchmoot is, and the Holy Post had a baby. Well, technically, our producer Mike and his wife did, but we're all super excited about it. And stay tuned for later in the show when we have a really great announcement about a special promotion for all of our Holy Post listeners that you're not going to want to miss. Okay, here is episode 586. Hey there, welcome back to the podcast. This is Phil Vischer. This is the Holy Post Podcast. I am here with Sky Jatani. Hi, Sky. Hi, Phil. And Caitlin Shess. Hi, Caitlin. Hi, Phil. And if you don't have the video, picture the cutest librarian you've ever seen in your whole life, because that's what Caitlin looks like today. The cutest librarian you've ever seen in your whole life. That's so nice. And I thought you were going to flip it at the end there and say, no. Sky also has books behind Sky, <laughs> I look Sky, like the bouncer at the library. <laughs> Sky looks like the grumpiest baseball manager you've ever seen. <laughs> I don't that's know. That's a, that's a for pretty an, hard bar for to an reach. all black team. Yeah, right. I'm wearing a black shirt. I have a black yep. hat. Yep. I and you're good. in a black room. You have a black hat, that's black true. shirt, black room, and, you know... I guess now you're smiling because I pointed out that you were. A <laughs> now he's going to work hard. At I was smiling the moment we started recording. I do not believe that to be the case. And now it's time for the theme song. What's the news that you like the most? Who's your favorite podcast host? If it's breakfast, get your toast. It's Sky and Phil and the Holy Post. Sky and Phil and the Holy Post. And sometimes Caitlin. Today's episode is sponsored by Sundays. This is Phil. I have a dog. You have a dog. We love our dogs and we gotta feed them something. Fresh food with human grade ingredients is a better way to treat our dogs than that old bag of whatever that stuff is. Sawdust and cow bones? I have no idea. But fresh pet food is expensive and inconvenient. And that's where Sundays comes in. No, not the day. The new dog food company that makes air dried dog food from a short list of human grade ingredients. It's healthy with beef, chicken, and digestive aids like pumpkin and ginger. It's convenient. Unlike other fresh Fresh dog foods, it's zero prep, zero mess, and zero stress. Sundays is shelf stable and ships right to your door. And it's affordable, costing 40% less than other healthy dog food brands because they don't waste money shipping frozen packages. We've got a special offer for our dog loving holy posters. Get 35% off your first order of Sundays. Go to Sundaysfordogs.com slash holy post or use the code holy post at checkout. That's Sundaysfordogs.com forward slash holy post. Upgrade your pup to Sundays and feel good about the food you feed your dog. And thanks to Sundays for sponsoring this episode. Oh, dear. Okay, it would be fun to talk about something else. I Over the weekend, I was in um, Nashville, and I was going to be there on Sunday morning, so I thought, I'm going to go to Mike Erie's church. So I went to Mike Erie's church on Sunday morning mm. with Pastor Mike, and he also had to start out the service, you know, kind of unexpectedly and talk about Israel and um, the Palestinians. And he, he did a very good job. He was very thoughtful. I wish he was mm -hmm. here. Mike, come here and do what you did because I don't want to have to do it. So I assume you know, but uh, war's broken out in the Middle East yet again. Uh, Hamas attacked Israel on Saturday, killed apparently more than 600 Israelis, mostly citizens. And of course now, you know, Israel is returning fire and we'll see terrible things now happening to Palestinians on the other end. And there's not, I'm not an expert on the Middle East. I'm not going to pretend to be an expert on the Middle East. I don't quite understand what, and this, you know, if you have a perspective on this, what Hamas is hoping to gain by provoking yet another attack on their own land and their own 
people. Sky, you're kind of a political guy. What? Do you have but, more yeah, insight? but I'm not about to pretend I understand the motivations and, and geopolitics of Hamas. But it, it does seem, I've, obviously, those families and the victims of this attack, your heart breaks. And for those mm-hmm. who don't know what happened to their kids or their family members, whatever, those who were kidnapped, it's just horrific and terrifying. I also grieve for the fact that there are going to be a lot of innocent Palestinians that suffer because of this as Mm -hmm. well. So Hamas's decision and their allies to undergo this attack might get spun as this is in the interest of the Palestinian cause, but it's really not in the interest of the Palestinian people. Mm -hmm. And that's what's tragic, because there's a lot of innocent people who want peace, who want a, a good solution to this ongoing conflict, who believe in the human dignity of all sides who are going to be the victims of this and that's just awful yeah and there's always uh dehumanization that sets in almost immediately after something like this and we saw it from the head of the uh, israeli defense force who said we're dealing with with human animals not fully Mm -hmm. humans which is a great way to justify what you're about to do next um, and unfortunately, we've seen that, you know, forever. And of course, you, it's on the other side as well with, with Hamas, you know, and, and the uh, Iran- Iranians and everyone else. You know, the, the, the Israelis are, are subhuman and we need to wipe them off the face of the earth. So people are so good at coming up with reasons to deny the humanity of the other guy uh, so that it doesn't feel bad to do what we really want to do next. And I'm, I'm kind of shuddering, you know, because effectively Hamas just went up to the big kid in the lunchroom and smacked him across the face. And, and Israel is in such an interesting, interesting place because they're strong, but they're also very vulnerable at the same time because of their location and the fact that they're surrounded by mostly uh, hostile countries and people who have a uh, often religious motivation to see their destruction. And, you know, if... And that's that's my big question about Hamas is is this rational or irrational, you know is this is this because if it's rational, it's a little bit scary because the thought is are they trying to provoke a larger conflict, you know that would draw in Syria, draw in Lebanon, and ultimately maybe draw in uh, Iran, and that's that's terrifying. Or maybe it's irrational and they just wanted to see how much harm they could do, you know, before the the hammer drops in the other direction. And, you know, the more bad things happen back to their own people, to a certain extent, the more the world community gets mad at Israel uh, for, you know, using the power they have that the Palestinians don't have. But it also just continues the narrative that we're we're being oppressed, we're you know being occupied, and and we, we all need to f- fight together. Caitlin, do you have any insights, thoughts? I mean, help I, us. I agree with Sky that I am not an expert in any of this, and I do think this is one of the best examples of something that is so complicated that anyone who's claiming to be the person that has like the insight that fixes all of this is just proving that they're not someone to listen to. If it was clear what the best response by any actor in this was, they would have done it and it would be clear to all of us what to do, but it's not clear. Um, I do think it's interesting, we're, we're studying Revelation in my Bible study at church right now. And there's such a contrast in my mind between the folks who who might respond to something like this while they're reading Revelation with, ah, let's figure out (laughs) where Mm -hmm. this fits in all of this kind of supposed timeline. And instead, I was just struck today, I'm teaching this week on um, chapters eight and nine, and even earlier in chapter six, when it's talking about the cries of, of the righteous to God, of how long, Lord, will you let this go on? And it's not clear if you're reading this well it's not clear like any political affiliation of who gets to be the one that's the righteous person crying how long lord it's just those people that are suffering that are that are putting their faith in christ and are not seeing any kind of earthly ability to resolve the things that are causing them pain and then the beautiful response in chapters eight and nine where there's still so much conflict and a lot of interpreters think this isn't a future event this is just the reality while we await christ's return of of suffering and violence and and conflict where it's not clear the good guys and the bad guy like that's not discernible to human eyes always but there is just great suffering but in those chapters one of the things that the writer of revelation is doing is saying the the those prayers actually make it to the throne room of god and it was it's a comfort to me 
when I don't know any kind of earthly political response to this, to know that it is both quite powerful to pray. It is described in Revelation as not just passive disengagement with the world, but actually one of the most powerful responses that we have is to pray to God who sees the things that I can't see, who sees the right responses I can't discern, and that those prayers aren't just wafting up to nowhere and just dissolving in the air. They end up in the throne room of God, and the response of God ultimately, eschatologically, is judgment of all unrighteousness and evil and injustice, including those things that I don't perceive as injustice now, but God knows are, and not including those things I think are injustice now that God knows isn't. That's not a reason to not do your research into this and learn what you can about what might be proper responses, especially as we come into an election year and the US does play a role in this. We should all be thinking about that. But I do think it gives me comfort in knowing that I won't make perfect judgments about this, but Mm -hmm. the prayers of people to God do not go unheard. Yeah, I do wonder how long it's going to be before the uh, prophecy folks jump all over this. And oh, they're already on it. Yeah, I've they seen, are. I've, I've seen it on social media. They're already making hay, which is which, sad. This is a good reminder, yeah. too, in general, when it comes to Israel, that like it, it is fairly recent in our history that we have thought there would be any pre-return of Christ changes in Israel that were discernible to us to kind of outline a timeline. Like pre-1948, Everyone, including the dispensationalists, were like, anything that happens with Israel is after Christ returns. There's nothing we'll be able to discern in a timeline now. So if anyone's Mm -hmm. telling you, I know what role Israel plays in all of this, that's an incredibly new interpretation of things that you should, you know, respond to with a lot of skepticism. But it's great for business. So what what should we do if we're we're going to not speculate about prophecy, which I am not going to do, what can, and, and I am going to hold up all of these people in prayer because you yeah. know I'm I'm distraught over the Israeli families that were harmed on Saturday and I'm distraught over the Palestinian families that are going to be harmed over the next mm-hmm. week month year I don't know I don't know what happens next um, so, so what can we do anything I think part of it is the people of Christ we need to advocate for and celebrate wherever justice is done and people are treated with dignity and there has been criticism of the Israeli government for a long time in some of the dehumanizing things that they have done to Palestinians. And clearly, when groups like Hamas and Hezbollah and others engage in terrorism against innocent people, that's incredibly unjust mm-hmm. and dehumanizing of Israelis and Israeli citizens. So rather than looking at someone's label or the flag they fly, we need to look at what is of God and his kingdom, what is mm. dignifying to humans what is just, what is right, and celebrate that where it occurs, condemn it where it doesn't. And th- that's one of the things that's really been disappointing in the last couple of days, especially some of the rhetoric on social media. It's mm-hmm. feeling like like everything else these days, you have to pick a side. Mm-hmm. You have to either mm-hmm. be 100% for the Israelis or 100% for the Palestinians. And, and I don't think that's what we're called to. I think mm-hmm. we're called to condemn what is evil and to celebrate mm-hmm. what is good, regardless of who's doing it. Yeah. Yeah, so we are praying for the peace of Jerusalem. We're also praying for the peace of the Gaza Strip and Gaza City. And we're praying for all of God's children made in his image that are going to suffer because of the ideologies of their leaders. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm just, I am concerned that, and we'll probably, I assume it's already happening, but when the church in America harnesses eschatology to help them dehumanize people. Not only did you do something bad to Israel, but you did something bad to God. And now you're in God's way and you know, and so you deserve to be smashed and you deserve to be treated as subhuman. So let's Mm -hmm. just, let's just not, let's just not. WWJD people, ah, okay. I don't have anything else to say about that. I'm not an expert. I don't wanna pretend to be an expert. It's going to be ugly, and I think it's the going forward maybe uglier than what we've seen already, um, and that's that's really sad, and it's kind of changed the focus of the world right now mm-hmm. um, into you know does this have the potential to escalate, and if so, how much? Um, over the weekend, I was in Nashville. I was down there for Hutchmoot. Do either of you know what Hutchmoot is? Yeah. 
No, I do. Not. You've been there before, Phil. I've been there before. I've been to Hutchmoot before. Caitlin doesn't know what Hutchmoot is. It's uh, a funny word. I know. It's a very fun word. Andrew Peterson, the singer-songwriter, and his brother Pete Peterson started something called the Rabbit Room years ago. Uh, the Rabbit Room is where the Inklings met in the back of a pub near... Oh, I thought that was where Hugh Hefner had his first meeting. Sky. No, Sky Jatani. <laughs> oh. Don't you be like that. Um, see, you've made Caitlin uncomfortable. Are you, are you happy with yourself? Yeah, you're, I am. You're happy with yourself? <laughs> you're happy with... Okay. That's, that's our cute librarian is oh, now, man. now uncomfortable. Um... <coughs> Sorry, I'm a little bit sick. I came back a little under the weather. I'm coughing right into the mic. That's fantastic. They uh, So the Rabbit Room is a group. They publish some stuff. They have now have their own publishing arm. It's kind of artsy, creative Christians that don't necessarily fit in at any other, you know, like the Gospel Coalition or, you know, whatever, John Piper's <laughs> stuff. They don't fit in anywhere. Uh, it's a lot of illustrators and singer-songwriters and thinkers and authors. And they get together once a year to do a conference, and the conference is called Hutchmoot, um, which, yeah. A hutch where does is, that come from? A hutch is where rabbits live, and moot is a form of a meeting, like when the Ents in Lord of the Rings, they moot together. Yeah, the Ent moot. The Ent moot. I cannot tell if y'all are messing with me. <laughs> Well, you're not a Lord of the Rings person. You wouldn't know. No, it it's a, fully no, a sounds hutch, like you're making something up. A hutch you know what is a hutch where is. it's a hutch is a is a rabbit hole den thing. It's a it's okay. a rabbit cage. It's the yeah. kind okay. of house we build for rabbits. I'm googling because I Caitlin. don't trust you, Caitlin. We would never lead you astray. Caitlin. Right, you never would. We would never take you down some rabbit trail that leads to nowhere. <laughs> and if you would lead last, to a hutch moot. If your last name last name is Hutchinson. You are the son of a rabbit house. <laughs> okay. I don't. That's very, oh, okay. Okay. It's very much Python. You just found it, didn't you? you? Yeah. Okay. Son of okay. a rabbit house. Okay. So, so you're there. Okay. So anyway, I was there and they had did a panel discussion. I was on a panel discussion about humor and Christianity, the somewhat mm -hmm. tenuous relationship between <laughs> Christians and comedy. Um, and, and it was interesting. It was me and Mike Naraki, who's Larry the Cucumber, to my Bob the Tomato, and Andrew Peterson, who wrote a great, uh, if you're looking for an, an adventure book series to read to mm -hmm. your kids, The Wing Feather Saga is fantastic. And my friend Chris Walls working with Andrew Peterson to produce it as an animated series. Currently, um, they're, I think they're close to finishing the season one of six episodes, and then they're going to come back with seven more episodes next year. So I was there. We talked about humor and Christianity. It was interesting. We talked about, I kind of compared it to the scandal of the evangelical mind and what's the scandal that there isn't much of an evangelical mind. And then the scandal of evangelical comedy is that there isn't much evangelical mm -hmm. comedy. And a couple key reasons, which I think you'll both find this very interesting mm. and it may change your lives, but I'm not sure. Um, one of my thoughts is that there were funny Christians in England, but they're not the ones who came to America. <laughs> we got the Puritans. <laughs> we got the ones who banned Christmas and fined people for singing Christmas carols. So mirth is not something that came across with the pilgrims. Mm. So we, we got Ebenezer Scrooge. Yes. Bob and, and the, Humbug. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. And, and the second point was... Um, and I was thinking about this a lot. I think this is interesting to, to dive into. Like looking at stand-up comedy, stand-up comedy historically in the U.S. was born primarily out of and developed in two communities, the Jewish community, Borscht Belt comedians, and then the African-American community uh, mm -hmm. with the Chitlin Circuit mm -hmm. comedians. And in both cases, what you didn't see early on, like not until post-World War II and, and really, you know, late in the almost to the 60s, is a whole lot of white Anglo-Saxon Protestant comedy. Yeah, um, that's pretty obvious, though. Yes. I know it's uh, I'm not saying it's not obvious, but here's what, what can you learn from that? Hey, guess what? What, what, what did the Jewish community and the African-American community have in common? Mm. They had no power in America. 
They had nothing to lose, nothing to protect, and they had to respond to difficulty with a sense of humor. Okay. That's what humor's for. It's, it's a way of coping with an unjust world well, who says through that? laughter. Who, who said that? What are you, who are you quoting? Who are you I'm quoting? quoting myself. You have, you have d- divined the purpose of humor. Yes, it is, Just it now. is our species way of coping with a broken world. But if you are part of a community that's in charge of the world, yes. what do you have to cope with? Right. You have nothing to cope with except fear of losing your position, right. which does not make you funny. It makes you angry. Exactly. So, and, and so we talked a lot about like, like what happened to the Babylon Bee was one of the questions because the Babylon <laughs> Bee used to be funny and self-referential to the evangelical community. And then they discovered there was more money in owning the libs than there is in pointing out our own foibles uh, because mm. fundamentalist Christians are so kind of obsessed with the perceived loss of power. Uh, and that produces, doesn't produce comedy, it produces anger. And so we weaponize humor, you know, because we're mad that Stephen Colbert makes fun of us or we're mad that whoever's making fun of us. And so we want to try to return fire. So we look for funny people who can be caustic and aggressive and angry funny back at them. And that's just not very funny. I've, I've never understood people who like or are attracted to angry funny. Like even even Sam Kinison back in the day. Now that's a reference Kate yeah. was guaranteed not to know. Yeah, but like he was like, an anger comic. Yeah, uh, like angry comedy just doesn't. It seems like oil and water. It just doesn't work for me. Well, and I I don't know who why people like that so much because, these days. Because because they're shooting at your enemies. You're if they're shooting at people you don't like, they're pointing out their unrighteousness. That makes you more righteous. That just feels more mean, though. It's it's. It feels I, good. It feels gross. <laughs> it feels gross. It's, oh, it's, you poke at other people sometimes, Sky. Some of your your barbs. Your yeah, but are, they're not. Mm. I would hope I'm not inflict. I'm not angry humor. Okay. It's it's you know, but I don't know. Like, there's a lot of that going on. I think Babylon B is a perfect example of it, where it's just yeah. mean. It's mean and funny, or it's trying to be funny, but it's really trying to be mean first and foremost. It's like mean with a little side of funny. And that mm-hmm, mean, mm-hmm. It's, it's like we're trying to still well, be Christian in our meanness, so we got to add a little bit of funny so people don't just see us as plain old mean because that's mm-hmm. not acceptable. Uh-huh. And that just, it's, it's icky. It feels gross to me. Okay. Well, I don't, I don't think, yeah. I, don't, I don't think... Like Daily Wire, you know, they use a lot of humor. I don't think they're using humor to try not to appear mean. I think they're using humor as a weapon intentionally to layer on top of meanness. It's like middle school mean. Yeah, well, it's like locker room. It's it's locker room talk. Uh, It's not good. Anywho, so it's tricky for... So, you know, we talked about when, as a Christian doing either humor writing or whatever you're doing well how do you know when you cross the line how do you know when you've gone too far and it's the the audience tells you the because it's different for every audience you don't know like you know when am i because i talked about my grandmother my grandmother was hilarious on my dad's side she was the source of the family's humor Uh, my grandfather was dominant very dominant figure not funny so he would kind of, we were all kind of, ah, oh, grandpa, you're so wow, loud and aggressive. And then grandma would say something kind of off the cuff on the side and crack mm. everybody up. And then grandpa would say, what'd she, what'd she say? What are you laughing about? <laughs> and it was typically a little joke at his mm. expense because he was the power. And so she was the subversive mm. voice yeah. against mm-hmm. the power. And that's the tradition that we see in Jewish mm-hmm. comedy and African-American comedy. It's not the tradition we see now in angry white folks that are afraid they're not going to be the dominant power anymore. And so they're you know, throwing lightning bolts down at, at formerly oppressed groups who they think are getting a little too uppity, shall we say. So, Phil, your only thing is you don't know the line until the audience tells you you've crossed it. Um, like how much could I, I poke fun at my grandfather? Yeah, cause I actually said, if, if I said, for me, it would be imagining what could I say about my grandfather 
that my grandmother would not approve of. That's when I've crossed the line. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. Because it's different for different groups. The, when you when when you go and and speak, when I go and speak, mm -hmm. you know, I I'll usually have a couple of pieces of humor in the first mm -hmm. minute or so that will let me gauge the room. And if the room doesn't respond well to those first one or two attempts at humor, I will change my delivery for the mm -hmm. rest of the talk because I know there's a chance I will offend in that room because they're not with me. So which, which rooms have been the most dead, Phil? I'm who, not who, who are the least funny <laughs> audience? <laughs> I'm not going to. No, Sky. No. Caitlin, what about, I'm curious from your point of view, like not that you're an expert in comedy, but you do know <laughs> the Bible. Not that you're funny. <laughs> no, you're not funny at all. No, but you know the Bible really well. Like there's humor in the Bible. There are, yeah. there are and like Paul at times, others, like they, they say some pretty tough things about some of their critics that are kind of funny. Like is that, in your mind, does that open the door for critique from a biblical point of view that includes for, humor? For insult comics for Christ? I mean, I, <laughs> no, definitely not. <laughs> I feel like it's, yeah, I feel like what Phil said, it depends on if you're a part of the group that you're making fun of. Like a lot of the humor, I think we often do this with Jesus and the Pharisees. We're like, oh, Jesus told them so I can go tell some people. And it's mm. like, well, Jesus is still part of that community. Like we pit those as two different groups when like, they're significantly sharing religious and cultural heritage. And in many ways, he is in the line of those kinds of people. He's asserting a different kind of authority, but it's still in that same realm. Whereas yeah, it would a Jewish be very, rabbi. Literally, yeah. So it's yeah. like, it, that's a different kind of thing. I think there's a, a parallel too, even if it's not humor. If it's some people will go to the prophets and be like, oh, I get to talk that way about people because that's what they did. When mm -hmm. so often it's like both a, a intra-community kind of thing and even when it's not, even when it's against people who are sort of outside of the community, it's like against such great injustice and it's really out of a place of like heartbrokenness over the injustice. And too often it's like for us, this is a, a way to, to, to gain power or to kind of assert something against someone that's really kind of, um, yeah, still a power mm -hmm. play and not like really coming from a place of real heartbrokenness. But I, I have no idea what I would do in terms of like how that applies to what people can can appropriately say here. It, now, other than that, I do think what whether this feels like an intercommunity thing is something to consider. Yeah, if I if I went to a church in South Korea and tried to do a five minute <laughs> comedy set, there's a very high likelihood either that I would just never have the audience in the first place or that I would cross some line without knowing about it mm -hmm. because I don't know mm -hmm. the culture. And when we look at Jesus and say, oh, look, he's doing funny insults at the Pharisees. Ha, 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 ha. Because we don't know the culture, we don't mm -hmm. know if those would actually be perceived as funny. Yeah. You know, we don't know if, if like the, the apostles are, you know, cracking up on the side or if they're just, or, or if he's in following a norm in that culture that was a way of speaking mm -hmm, prophetically, mm -hmm. and it's not a joke at all. So you know, the way I joke with my my like oldest friends is very different than I would joke mm -hmm. with a stranger at a coffee shop because I could very easily cross the line with a stranger at a coffee shop because I don't know their background and I don't know the context that we're interacting yeah. in. So that's why I say it's it's up to the audience. I do think if you're if you are dehumanizing with your humor that's a line that you've crossed already. But you can say things that one person would take as dehumanizing and a good friend would just laugh, right. you know, and slap you back. <laughs> and that's based on relationship. So it varies. So, Phil, I don't know if you remember this, but years ago, Dallas Willard, when he was at Okoboji, and we were both yeah. there attending, somebody, a I wrote a devotional about this recently. Somebody asked Dallas, how do you know when you're mature in your faith? Yes. And he gave a response that was really surprising. It's not at all what that. I expected. And and he said, a mature Christian is almost impossible to offend. And mm. we can unpack all, all that means. But it it seems like in our culture, just generally, people are always looking to be offended. Mm -hmm. They're trying to find something to be angry about because we have made offense into a sign that you really care about something. Mm. And so easel, eas being easily offended is what... It's not just Christians. A lot of groups do this, but Christians are often easily offended as a way of 
virtue signaling how much they care about their faith or how much they care about scripture or how much they care about Christian morality or you know, fill in your blank. And so it makes comedy almost impossible among Christians because they're constantly looking to show how spiritual they are through being offended. Yeah. And that's not a great environment in which yeah. to poke yeah. fun at your own foibles or that of the world. We also we also talked about the you know kind of righteousness that we've seen in fundamentalist Christianity that says you can't that's not funny. You've gone too far. Mm-hmm. You know, right. that's not funny. You've gone too far that we now see you know, on the left in, totally. in the secular righteousness mm-hmm. and the number of, of stand-up comedians that just say, I won't do college shows anymore because college kids just don't have senses of humor mm-hmm. anymore. You know, they're mm-hmm. so easily offended that I can't. And, and partly, part of it is a generational uh, difference yeah. in that if you are a college kid and you know the way your friends are wired, you know that they'll think this is funny, but they won't think that is funny. You know, and if you're Jerry Seinfeld and you're, 65 however old he is and you walk onto you know a a liberal college campus you have no idea you have no idea what you're stepping into because you've got two or three generations between you you know and and cultural what we find culturally funny is constantly evolving so it is very hard to be funny for people you know 40 years older or younger than yourself can i say that and mm-hmm. we, do, we, we see that fundamentalist impulse now more and more in secular mm-hmm. society as well as Christian society. We're all becoming yeah. fundamentalist Christians. Everyone. Well, we're all becoming fundamentalist something. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't yeah. say Christians. Mm-hmm. Okay, I, okay. Th- the way I interpreted Dallas's idea and your, what you're trying to say here, Phil, is I think easy offense is actually a tell that there's some kind of chronic idolatry going on. Because when you are devoted to a very, very fragile God, you must come to that God's defense quickly Mm. whenever that God is being exposed for the ridiculous deity that he or it is. So if if your idol is being poked fun at, you must show deep offense in order to protect its its integrity. So as our cultures become more and more idolatrous and we've made more and more things central to our identity, which really shouldn't be, we get more and more easily offended to protect those false gods and idols that we are carrying all the time. Caitlin. That's my interpretation of it. Caitlin, stand up for your generation. I know. Well, I, while you were talking, Sky, I was thinking, because my initial reaction to what you said Dallas Willard said is kind of like, ugh, and then I was like, oh, am I doing like the thing <laughs> there you go. that he said? Um, I mean, I know I'm not a very mature Christian, to be honest, but I, while you were talking, I was thinking about, um, she's not on Twitter anymore, but Leah Boyd, who was the sassy seminarian, Mm. I think she's hilarious. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that I thought was so funny about her was that she was often dealing with like gender dynamics and especially kind of sexist reactions to her. But at kind of like you were just describing, she had such a strong, and I think still has, you know, such a strong sense of what is true and God's dignifying and honoring of women that she could take people saying that stuff and find a way to just make it funny because it was like, well, it's just absurd and ridiculous that you would believe this thing about women. It wasn't like, it was helpful to see that her response was not offense, not because that thing is not awful and you just Mm -hmm. aren't taking it seriously enough, but because it's like, well, how ridiculous is it that this man thinks he can say something about women that in any way actually impinges on what God has ultimately said about women? And it made the stuff that she said really funny and also really like poignant in some ways, because it did just expose the ridiculousness of the things that people were saying. But I do think that is kind of a rare thing for, she's younger than I am. And I do think Mm -hmm. the average response is that we don't, because we don't have such an unshakable sense of what's actually true. We have to prove the dignity of women or whatever Mm -hmm. the cause is, we have to prove that it feels so unstable. You can't say that thing, or it might really be a crack in the foundation of the truth that we're trying to build. Whereas I think it's actually a, a profoundly Christian response that she had to be like, Nothing you say can actually change what God has right. said already, and so I can laugh at it, and it's mm-hmm. ridiculous. I, that's a beautiful illustration of the point. Yeah, the, the truth and, and God himself is not weak or fragile and yeah. therefore does not need my meager defense or my offense to protect it. Amen. Okay, so can we do comedy? Can I do comedy? You Caitlin? can. Caitlin? You can try. I can. <laughs> you can. You go I ahead, can. Bill. Are you going to work? Are you going to try to work more comedy into your academic writing? 
No. <laughs> I hear You're talking about like another that. place where it doesn't go over well. Mm, uh, no, no, no. You cross the well, line. Well, academics try a lot to do funny titles to their boring papers, and they're oh, terrible. They're oh, not. Bet. I'm never going to do yeah. that because it would be bad. I've been wanting for a long time to write a piece uh, comparing preachers to stand-up comics because I think mm-hmm. there's a ton of similarities in those two <laughs> vocations. I really do. Um, and, you know, most preachers I know have significant father issues and deep insecurities and need an audience to feel affirmed. And I mm. think that's true of stand-up comics too. But the thing, the reason I'm really interested in that topic though is I feel like, and this is probably wrong, but I kind of feel <laughs> like a lot of preachers in America have lost their prophetic edge. Like they're scared to talk about tough things. Mm-hmm. And increasingly I'm encountering that kind of cultural critique and prophetic edge coming from stand-up comics. Mm-hmm. In a way that it used to come from preachers, and so anyway, I'm intrigued by the whole over the Venn the Venn diagram overlap between stand up comics and preachers because I'm I think in, I'm going intrigued on there. I'm intrigued by the question uh, which comedians are more likely to disappear from polite society against their own will comedians that just tell jokes and tell the wrong joke or comedians that actually are trying to make a point and mm. make the wrong point at the wrong time. So the prophetic, you know, mm. more prophetic comedians, Dave Chappelle being a, a, a key example, is always flirting, you know, always on the edge of, of getting cast out of polite society. Whereas, you know, the Jim Gaffigans uh, that are primarily just telling stories about how fat and lazy they are, you know, in, di- <laughs> in different contexts. <laughs> I'm fat and lazy in this mm-hmm. context. And then we laugh, ha, 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 ha. Mm-hmm. He, he's never gonna get canceled. Because he's, he's really not, yeah, yeah. I mean, I like him, and I, I like right. his comedy. He doesn't take huge risks, mm. you know, w- when he goes out there, as opposed to a Dave Chappelle or a Louis C.K., who's, you know, bye. Yeah, but not because he took risks, though, but because he was kind of a yeah. jerk. I, don't you think, Ch- like, Chappelle's a really good example. Part of the reason why he's still out there is partly because he's making a ton of money for Netflix and for other... Like, no one's going to cancel him because he's the golden goose. Like, he's just too successful. He's beyond getting canceled. If he weren't as successful and he was trying to pull some of the stuff he's saying, I think he probably would be canceled. J.K. Rowling isn't going to be on Netflix anytime soon. That's true. She didn't even get to be Mm. in the the 20-year Potter reunion special for the love. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, okay. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. I had another story, uh, David Brooks. David Brooks. David French wrote a piece, uh, why, uh, One Reason the Trump Fever Won't Break, which was fascinating. It was in the New York Times. I was going to talk about it last week, and we ran out of time. I was going to talk about it this week, and we've run out of time. But, Phil, so maybe we'll we talk have, about it we next have week. one what? really, 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 really important announcement that we're all supposed oh. to talk about. Oh, that's right. That's right. Baby! <laughs> is, that the, is that the right one? Actually, baby. no, but yeah, that is Mike another one. Baby. <laughs> Mike! Mike Stralo and his wife, Kelia. Mike Stralo is the producer of the show. Last week, they had a baby, Baby Miles. Yay! And we're trying to, we've already signed up Miles for an internship so he can start doing some research and responding to email for us. And he didn't say no. He didn't say no. So congratulations to Kelia and Miles on your new baby. Mm. What were you thinking of, Scott? You, you mean Mike and Kelia on their new baby, <laughs> What Miles. did I say? Miles and Kelia. Kelia and Mike on their baby Miles. And for those who are wondering, this is their third boy. So they have a a busy household and we're really excited for them. Uh, Mike actually wanted us to make sure we announced this. And that is we are doing for a limited time a very special opportunity where anybody can sign up for Holy Post Plus for free. What? For a trial period to get access to all of the bonus material. But here's why this is especially great, because this week we are releasing two really huge bonus things exclusively for Holy Post Plus, and that is an exclusive bonus episode of Why I'm Still a Christian. This time it's a conversation with Philip Yancey. That Who was that Hutchmoot be... over the weekend, by the way? He was with you? There you yeah. go. So we did a bonus uh, interview with him about why I'm still a Christian that will only be for Holy Post Plus supporters. And this week we are releasing the next episode of Getting Schooled by Caitlin Chess, where Caitlin schools me on Taylor Swift. Yeah. So if if you have never signed up for Holy Post Plus and you want to try it out without any risk for free, this is the week to do it. Go to holypost.com 
sign up for the free trial period. And not only will you get those two bonus episodes, but you'll get access to all of the past stuff. So you can listen, watch to your heart's content, all the material that you've been missing out on. And hopefully you will stick around and become a long term. Wow. Supporter of That's Post. amazing. Do you know what, do you yeah. know what the fastest way is to get canceled from polite society in America? Hmm. Break up with Taylor Swift. Ooh. Ouch. Justified. <laughs> Justified. Be warned. Travis Kelsey, yeah. be warned. Step America's carefully. princess. America's princess. Don't mess with America's princess. Okay, <laughs> America. Um, I think Caitlin is America's next princess. <laughs> That's just, so nice, Bill. Li- librarian princess. It's a. It's a. Yeah. Which, that is. Which that is NFL actually star? what I said as a kid. I wanted to be a librarian, a librarian princess. princess. <laughs> yeah. So Here which comes NFL a star with you want to tray like always? It's Bell. Your Bell. <laughs> Sorry, Phil. So, Sky's trying to set me up with an NFL player. Yeah. Well, okay, which NFL okay. star do we need to set her up with? I don't know. Let's figure it out. Get on it, America. First, we'll have to explain to her what the NFL is. Then I know what the NFL is. I don't know what those three letters stand for, but I know it's about football. <laughs> the F is for football. Maybe the F. I would guess the F Maybe is football. Maybe it's the F. I don't know. National uh, Football League? Hey. hey there you go. That I can tell you were a champion debater. Uh, Because you can think on your feet and come up with the right answer. Okay, thanks, everybody. We'll stop now. We got an interview. Who's the interview with? You told me, but I forgot. How did you forget? Oh, it's you. It's you. The interviews with Sky. Caitlin interviews Sky about his new book on heaven. This is fascinating. Stick around, everybody. His book comes out. When's your book come out? October 17th. October 17th. It's so close. And Caitlin's book is already out. You can still buy it. They didn't like pull it back yet, did they? No, we have not done that. No. Okay, good. It's still out. <laughs> you can buy it. She's working on her next one. It'll be out in a month. No, I'm making nope, that up. No chance. All right, y'all. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. Bye. This episode is sponsored by Fabric by Gerber Life. Remember all those life insurance ads on the radio when you were a kid? Uh, Probably not, because that was for your parents to worry about. Well, guess what? Now you're the parent, and now's the time to get life insurance to help protect your family. Fabric by Gerber Life makes it quick and easy to get a high-quality policy so your family is covered. Fabric was designed by parents for parents to help you get a high-quality, surprisingly affordable term life insurance policy in less than 10 minutes. With quality policies like a million dollars in coverage for less than a dollar a day, you could go from start to to covered in less than 10 minutes with no health exam required. Join the thousands of parents who trust Fabric to protect their family. Apply today in just minutes at meetfabric.com slash holypost. That's meetfabric.com slash holypost. M-E-E-T fabric.com slash holypost. Policies issued by Western Southern Life Assurance Company. Not available in certain states. Prices subject to underwriting and health questions. Thanks to Fabric by Gerber Life for sponsoring this episode. This episode is sponsored by Dreamland Baby. Lisa and I raised three kids, and we remember how precious sleep is when there's a baby in the house. When the founder of Dreamland Baby noticed a heavy blanket helped their son calm down and go to sleep, the Dreamland Baby Sleep Sack was born. A gently weighted sleep sack that has helped more than half a million families sleep better because their babies are sleeping better. Easy to use, soft and comfy, with evenly distributed weight from shoulders to toes. Seen on Shark Tank, featured in Forbes, and now sold in top retailers like Target and Nordstrom. 100% soft and natural cotton, plus thoughtful touches like a two-way zipper for easy diaper changes. Bring better sleep to your baby and your whole house with a Dreamland Baby weighted sleep sack. Go to dreamlandbabyco.com and enter the code HOLYPOST at checkout to receive 20% off site-wide plus free shipping. This offer is for new and existing customers. That's dreamlandbabyco.com with the code Holy Post. And thanks to Dreamland Baby for sponsoring this episode. My friend and Holy Post pundit Mike Erie often says, good theology can't save us, but bad theology can harm us. And that's certainly true when it comes to our theology of heaven. Unfortunately, a lot of us have inherited some really bad theology about heaven, which is why I wanted to write my new book about it. It's called What If Jesus Was Serious About Heaven? A Visual Guide to Experiencing God's Kingdom Among Us. 
This is the fourth book I've written in the What If Jesus Was Serious series, and it launches October 17th. So you can pre-order it now, or if you're listening to this later, it should already be available. Just like the others in the series, the book is meant to be read sort of devotionally. Each chapter is only two to three pages. It includes a doodle. It's super accessible. But I think you're going to find it pretty surprising, especially all the things about heaven that we hold to be true, which frankly are just not found in the pages of the Bible, and all the things the Bible does say about heaven that we often conveniently ignore. That was really the heart of my conversation with Caitlin Chess. We sat down and talked about the book and this whole theology of heaven and why it is so important for us as followers of Christ to get this right. So here is Caitlin Chess talking to me about my new book, What If Jesus Was Serious About Heaven? Hi, Sky. Hi, Caitlin. It feels so fun to be on this side and be like, welcome Sky Jatani to the Holy Post. <laughs> I, I'm happy to be a guest. Thank you for having me. Um, so today we're talking about your new book, What If Jesus Was Serious About Heaven? And I'm curious, now that this, what number is this? Of this the is what if four. Four. Yeah. Okay, so they're all what, behind me for people Yeah, they're are... beautiful. Uh-huh. Um, what made you want this to be the next topic? Why was this the next What If Jesus Was Serious book? Uh, two things, two reasons. Part of th- these books have come out of my daily devotional that mm-hmm. I write on with God daily, and I'll do different series, and it's kind of a platform not only to hopefully help people commune with God, but to just test ideas and and process what I'm learning with other people. And so I did a series a while ago about heaven, and I was surprised at the feedback I got from my subscribers, like that they were learning things they had never heard before, even though they've been Christians for decades, or coming to read familiar texts very differently. And so I realized, okay, I kind of struck a nerve here with a popular topic that I think people widely misunderstand. So that was one indication Mm -hmm. that, hey, maybe this would be good for a, a book in the series. But then secondly, I think a lot of the books I've written over, you know, the last 15 years are often focused on areas or ideas that I think are malforming us as believers. Mm -hmm. So like my first book was on consumerism and I've done books about eschatology and just ideas that um, I think without correction lead us astray. And I was increasingly realizing a lot of what we've been popularly taught about heaven and, and the assumptions we carry about heaven as Christians are malforming us. They're mm-hmm. leading us in the wrong direction. And so I wanted to write a book that would kind of recalibrate those assumptions and hopefully with that correction, bringing more faithfulness, more um, hope and a proper perspective on what we're actually supposed to be about as Christians. And, you know, shockingly, it's not primarily heaven. So um, yeah. I had to tackle this. Yeah, it's some. it's interesting. Just this morning, I was talking to a friend and I was like, still continuously shocked by how wrong we get this. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that I, before I went to seminary, had a lot of these wrong ideas. But now that they're so important to me, you know, a different way of thinking about heaven and what heaven means, and especially such a focus in the Christian faith on the resurrection of our bodies and the redemption of creation, I keep running across people who I think you've been in church your whole life, you work for a Christian institution, and then they'll say or do things that make me think like, oh my goodness, how how have we gotten this so wrong? Um, you don't really talk about this in the book, but like, this seems so foundational to me. I'm surprised that this, that we do get this so wrong in so many ways. Why do you think that is? Because I'm really shocked by the number of Christians I run into who I'm like, you know some other really important theological doctrines very well. You actually can't explain the Trinity to me, which is you know, a pretty high bar actually for an American Christian to be able to do that. But when it comes to heaven or like end times questions, I'm shocked at how little they they know of things that seem pretty foundational to me. Yeah, that's that's sort of the million dollar question. I th- I think it deserves like a whole nother book, just why we get heaven <laughs> okay, so wrong. Okay, so write that one. <laughs> yeah, wait, this, this is what we get wrong about heaven and getting it right. And then the second question is, why do we get this so yeah. wrong? So here's my speculation. I, in my limited experience, I think think maybe two things jump out. One is, you may be shocked at how many Christians you know who speak poorly, poorly theologically about heaven. Mm -hmm. I'm shocked at how many pastors I know who speak really bad. So I think part of it is our teachers, and and well-intentioned, are 
just don't handle this doctrine biblically and handle it well because it's so ingrained culturally Mm -hmm. and in our values that we don't even we can't possibly some be something we got wrong because it's so central to what you know it's just inconceivable that we're wrong in the way we talk about this so we don't examine it but then in my limited experience even before this book came out i had been around the country and i've spoken in a few places dealing with some of the topics in the book and i've been surprised at how angry believers Mm. get at me Mm. when i start pointing out our false beliefs about heaven and and talk and bring them back to scripture and i think it's an indication of idolatry Mm. i think we have made an idol out of our cultural assumptions around heaven we have built so much of our faith around you know this idea that my loved ones are in heaven and they have mansions and there's golden streets and you know the, and all that all that cultural stuff which is not biblical and we've built so much of our hope around it that when i or some other voice of good hopefully theology comes along and starts pointing out what is actually in scripture about heaven it freaks people out and they get angry yeah and i think that's a deterrent to tackling it's so much easier to handle like oh, you know, you don't really kind of understand the interplay of the Old Testament law with the words of Jesus. Mm, Let's get mm -hmm. that straight. People are like, okay, like, fine, because changing that in their minds doesn't fundamentally change their faith. Um, Or even something like, you know, we don't really talk enough about the physical bodily resurrection of believers. And people are like, okay, that's cool, because it doesn't fundamentally change their faith. But when you say to them, hey, a huge chunk of what you've believed about heaven is profoundly unbiblical, that freaks people out and they get very defensive. And so I think we stay away from it. We just Mm -hmm. don't want to go there. Yeah. We're going to talk about a bunch of the specifics in the book, but how would you describe like the root or the general misunderstanding that people have about this? Like to just introduce people to the book, because it does seem like there's a, there's a theme throughout the different sections of like, we've gotten, some of this is not really particular misinterpretation of this one thing Jesus said or inter- misinterpretation of what Revelation talks about. It's just kind of a general misunderstanding of how we use this word heaven or we throw it around or kind of the mental picture that we have of it. How would you describe what's like generally wrong? Because someone could be listening so far and be like, wait, <laughs> isn't my idea totally right? Like maybe Sky is going to have some like modifications for what I think, but it seems like the book really has a much more foundational concern with, no, our whole image of this that we carry around with us is not a good one. Yeah, I, I think, um, again, two aspects of that. One is our, our definition of heaven, which we can talk about, but then the place of heaven in our understanding of our faith. Mm. So the very opening of the book, uh, I use the metaphor of the Copernium Revolution, where Copernicus comes along and says to the world, hey, uh, I don't think the Earth is at the center of the solar system. I think it's actually the sun, and here's all the evidence, and people flip out about that. But, of course, he was right, and in a similar way... Most modern Christians think of heaven as the centerpiece of our faith, that the Mm -hmm. goal of our faith and the the goal of the gospel is that we might enter heaven when we die. And the the central thesis of this book is that is not the centerpiece of our faith. And in fact, Jesus is the centerpiece of our faith, and heaven is peripheral to that. And until we restore our faith so that it revolves around Jesus rather than going to heaven when we die, we're going to fundamentally misunderstand pretty much everything in the New Testament. So there's that positional error we make, but then there's the definitional error of what is actually heaven. And there we tend to believe, well, heaven is this realm for the faithful who have died, that they will live forever with God in this celestial paradise. Uh, That is also not the biblical definition of heaven. And one of the very first things I tackle in the book is the word heaven in both Hebrew Mm -hmm. and Greek is actually plural, even though it's translated most of the time into English as singular. So Genesis 1-1 actually gets it right. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It's plural, but it's true throughout the Bible. It's plural, even though when we read it in English, it's singular. And that single shift has warped our perception of heaven. We think of Mm -hmm. it like a place like Chicago or Denver or you know, Greenland, it's a single place rather than a realm like the air or the ocean or, you know, so it's that way of thinking about it as a singular destination is profoundly malformative in our imaginations. What is a better definition? That's a, that's it. it, (laughs) it, Well, in, in both again, Hebrew and Greek, the heavens refers to multiple things. It refers Mm -hmm. to the atmosphere 
the air that's immediately around us. It refers to the upper atmosphere, which is what the ancient world saw as the, the abode of the stars and the sun and the moon. And it refers to the intangible, invisible realm of the spirits, meaning the gods or the one god in the case mm-hmm. of monotheism and of, of angels and other angelic spirits. So it's this immediately accessible and present realm as close as the air is that we are surrounded by. And it's also this um, invisible power realm of spiritual force. So when, um, for example, when Jacob has that vision of the heavens open mm-hmm. and he mm-hmm. sees, you know, angels ascending and descending on this stairway, and he wakes up and goes, oh, I, I didn't realize that God was in this place and I didn't know it. it the Celts refer to that as a thin place where the mm. where the barrier between heaven and earth is permeable and and the temple was seen as one of those places. And Jesus himself comes and declares himself to be that permeable layer between the realm of heaven and earth. So rather than thinking of it as this far off distant place where the dead go to be with God, heaven is right here. It is present right beside us all the time. We just often live without mm. the ability to perceive it, even though it's there. What about the kingdom of heaven? Is this is that different? I mean, I I remember learning in seminary that maybe there's a difference between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God, and and we often read stories that Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven and assume that that's future, and that maybe what mm-hmm. you're talking about when it comes to heaven, that's like how pre-modern minds thought about the world, but now Jesus introduces this new idea of this future kingdom. Is it different? Um, and if it's not, how how should we think about it? Yeah, I, I've been debted a lot to both Dallas Willard and N.T. Wright in their scholarship on this topic. But when Jesus speaks of the kingdom of heaven, he's referring to the realm in which what God wants done is done. Mm. And since God occupies the heavens, that is where he exercises his will versus the earth, which is often a place that operates in opposition to God's will. We see it all the time with injustice and evil and depravity and wickedness and sin, whereas the heavens, the realm where God exists is where his will is done. So when Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven is near or at hand, he's saying that realm where God wants things done, done, well, it's here now. And it's, it's taking root here, and you see it through his actions and words. And we are called to participate in that reconciliation of heaven and earth, most you know, beautifully articulated in the Lord's Prayer. Your mm-hmm. will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the ultimate trajectory of the entire biblical narrative, that heaven and earth would be reconciled in one place where the, the dwelling place of God is now with his people, as mm-hmm. Revelation says, and the two realms are one. That's the mission we're all a part of. That's what Jesus came to accomplish. And it's here now, but not entirely. And that's in eschatological language, we talk about the already, not yet yeah. reality of the kingdom of God. So um, and we can, and a big chunk of my book is about that and yeah. what that yeah. means. So rather than escaping the earth to get to some heavenly realm for the dead to you know enjoy music forever in some kind of horrific worship service, the, the mission <laughs> is ultimately to, to see the kingdom of God in heaven here on earth, and the two are reconciled in one, in, in a physical embodied reality. Yeah, you just talked about like five things that I want to turn to, yeah. but one of those things I want to come, I want to start with is I literally were doing Revelation in my Bible study at church, and we were in like chapters five or six last week, and one of the women in my group sort of sheepishly admitted, like, you know, I've really struggled my whole life with knowing that we're going to spend the rest of our life just singing to Jesus, and it sounds <laughs> yeah. so boring, and I'm uninterested in that, and. And it was like such a sad moment when I thought like, oh, you've basically spent your life being like, I have to consign myself to this reality and try and figure out how that's good news instead of why is that? Why do you think that's so powerful? And what's wrong with that idea? Because I do think people like you said before are really, you know, emotionally connected, even if they're like this woman who kind of is like, oh, I'm assuming in heaven, I guess I'll like things differently <laughs> than I do now. But why why is that wrong? And why do you think that has implications for us broader theologically? Because I could imagine yeah. someone also hearing, well, this is just kind of an esoteric theological question. Let this woman have her belief about singing in heaven. It's in Revelation. But it seems like there, it's more important than that. Yeah, it is. I, I think in order to understand the ultimate, you know, telos, the purpose of of humanity, you got to go back to the beginning in Genesis. Mm-hmm. Is why did God create us in the first place? 
And he created humanity as his representatives upon the earth, that they would rule the earth with him and on his behalf. He didn't create the man and woman to just stay in the garden and sing songs to him. (laughs) That's not what they were created to do. So it doesn't make sense at the end that humans would abide on the earth with God just to sing songs to him. It says that we will reign with him. We will rule the earth with him. That's exactly the language of Genesis. So ruling and reigning is not just singing songs. It's a whole bunch of other things. Now, your more direct question is, why do we keep Mm -hmm. falling into this view that, well, eternity is some never-ending worship service? Yeah. I kind of have a cynical explanation. You? I know. It's hard to believe. (laughs) I I think part of the problem is that church leaders, of which for many years I was one, have carried a posture that their vocation is the most important one. And therefore, what the church does in this present age is the most important work. Mm. And one of its primary tasks is gathering people together for corporate worship. And so when they're the people standing on the platform, whether as a worship leader singing music or as a preacher in a pulpit, we have a tendency to project our own sense of value Mm. and vocation upon not just every Christian, but literally upon the entire cosmos <laughs> to say, someday everyone's going to do what I do, and someday mm-hmm. everyone's going to engage in the activity that I think is the most important, which is gathering together and singing songs and worshiping God. And and we lack the imagination to see, how can changing a diaper be praising God? And how mm-hmm. can be creating beautiful art be praising God? Or how can be you know, discovering new things in science or, or, or reconciling numbers financially be part of worship and praising it. We don't have that imagination. And so we can't extrapolate how a new heaven and new earth could possibly involve all those kinds of activities as worship to God. It must just be singing endlessly forever and ever. Uh, and then we, you know, extract these little bits of revelation that speak about angelic voices or the yeah. elders singing around the throne of God. And we go, oh, that's, that must be what everyone's doing all the time. And it's just not. And it, that's funny that you say that because I feel like I spend a lot of time being like, I'm assuming I will study a lot in eternity. And maybe mm-hmm. that's me doing the same thing, of being like, everyone will be like me and want to read lots of books and think well, the logical I think, questions. I think there's a difference between <laughs> Caitlin Shess saying, oh, I'm wired this way and I'm going to worship yeah. God for eternity in my exploration and curiosity and learning. There's a difference between that and saying, and everyone else has right. to do that too. And that's where I think we take it too far. Absolutely, there will be singing and rejoicing yeah. and wonderful but to insist that's what everyone's going to do all the time i think is a is a bizarre vision of eternity it's weird that we think we're just like lobbing off parts of what we experience to be good human things and thinking that we just are done with those Mm -hmm. in eternity right um you mentioned earlier and you have a whole section of the book that's titled after this line from the lord's prayer your kingdom come your will be done and in the nursery at my church recently i was reading a little kid this book that was like a children's version of the lord's prayer And on the page that I could tell based on the order was supposed to be a translation for kids of your kingdom come, your will be done, was instead some version of like, God lives in heaven and one day I will be with him there forever. The complete (laughs) opposite of what the text actually says. Yes. I've never been so happy that these little toddlers can't read because I just (laughs) said a different thing than what was on there. But I feel like on the podcast in general, we talk a lot about sort of like an escapist mentality or this idea that like heaven is this place that we want to be and it kind of pulls us away from the earth. And I don't know that we always fully flesh out. We we talk about the implications of that politically or why that's not a good posture for us caring about our communities. But I think a lot of people hear that and go, but isn't that still what the Bible says? And, Mm -hmm. and, And not only... Um, because I have this idea of heaven or I've you know kind of accepted this, but I'm going back to passages like when Jesus says, I'm going to go prepare a place for you. And so I have mm-hmm. this mental image of there is some sense of away from here or to be away from the body is to be present with the Lord. Or So we pull those kinds of passages and we might go, okay, y'all, I understand that we should care about our communities and, and not be so escapist politically, but doesn't the Bible sort of say those things? Why is that not yeah. right? Um. John Walton is fond of saying we need to see, we need to know what we see rather than just see what we know. Hmm. And John 14 is a really good example of that. In the uh, farewell discourse with his disciples the night before um, his crucifixion, that's where you get that famous text of, I go to prepare a place for you. What is that text actually saying versus what do we think it's saying? Now, most of us read that and, and we 
automatically, without any consciousness, go, oh, he's talking about heaven. He's going to prepare mm -hmm. this celestial place where we're going to dwell with him. For mm -hmm. That's not in the text. In fact, nowhere in the farewell discourse, John 14, 15, 16, does Jesus say anything about heaven. So why do we think that? Well, there's thousands of years of church tradition that has been influenced by Greek philosophy and especially Gnosticism that has infected the way we read those words. Mm. What Jesus is actually talking about there is the cross. When he's saying, I'm, I'm leaving and I'm going to prepare a place, it's, those are not two separate acts. So like we think he's leaving through the cross and resurrection and then he's going to go prepare a place mm. for us. He's actually saying that his leaving and his preparing of a place are the same act. He's referring to his atonement on the cross, the death that paid for our sins and his resurrection, is how he is preparing a place for us with God. He's opening the way for us to be with God through his departure. And this same text is where the King James Version, in a very bad translation of the Greek, talks about many mansions. That's not, that's where you yeah. get the idea of him building mansions in heaven. That's not what the text says. It's, it's he's going to prepare a place, meaning prepare a uh, for, later in the same chapter, he talks about um, God abiding within us, mm -hmm. and he uses that same word. It's not God going to build a mansion within us where he can live. It just refers to a, a, a home or a abiding presence. So he's saying, I'm going to prepare a place for you with my Father. You will be able to abide with my Father and he with you forever through what I'm about to do on the cross. So some of these texts that we assume are about heaven— even though heaven's never mentioned, we carry that in because of tradition, not because it's what the text is actually saying. And sometimes we just need to step back and, and question our assumptions a little bit and discover that we're... I think it's very telling that we read John 14 and our imagination goes immediately to this realm of the dead called heaven mm -hmm. rather than to the cross because we have made heaven way, way more central mm -hmm. to our faith than the cross is. And again, there's something off about that. Yeah. And the fact that the apostles and all their preaching of the gospels throughout the book of Acts, they never mention heaven as the point of the gospel, but it's mm -hmm. so central to our preaching of the gospel. That's what I mean by the Capernaum kind of revolution yeah. of we've made heaven central when it's not. Jesus and his cross is central, which is what they talk about all the time in the gospel, mm -hmm. but we don't. So yeah, we're just, it, we're really warped. And, and that's why this book, for me was important is I feel like until we get this corrected, we're going to continue to have problems. Oliver Wendell Holmes famously said, some people are so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. Mm -hmm. And I think he's absolutely right. We have so focused on heaven that we have forgotten what we're called to on earth. Mm. I, th I think probably one of the reasons too, to add to the ones you gave before about why people both get this wrong, but are so attached to it is that for some people, the most church they ever get is a funeral or a handful of funerals mm -hmm. for people that they love. And so they're emotionally attached to what is said there about where their loved one is and what that means. And and there is something somewhat comforting about the kind of, you know, distorted version of this that people have accepted, this idea that your loved one is in a mansion with God and everything's perfect and beautiful. I mean, and part of that is true in like being with God, being our ultimate end. How, how would you respond to someone even pastorally who's thinking, OK, I'm with you on the, you know, biblical exegesis and the theology. But like, how do we respond to the person who's like, you're not only kind of disrupting my sense of what I believe in the abstract, you're disrupting this thing that's been comforting to me. And how should I think instead uh, than the ways that I've been handed down about where my loved one is or even my own self thinking about, you know, my own mortality and the fears that come with that? Yeah, I, I think we need to take our cues from the New Testament writers themselves. When Paul is trying to comfort distraught Christians over the persecution they're facing or over the fact that some of their sisters and brothers in Christ have, as he says, fallen asleep, they've died. Yeah. How does he comfort them? He doesn't comfort them by saying, oh, well, they're in heaven. That's not what he says. He comforts them by saying they are with Christ. And he comforts us by saying that no matter what we face in Romans 8, he talks about this, nothing in all of creation can ever separate us from the love of God in Christ, including death cannot separate us from Christ. It's not 
nothing can separate us from a mansion in heaven. It's not <laughs> nothing can separate us from this glorious paradise we're going to get to occupy one day. It's his hope and his comfort is in Christ himself. And again, this is where a lot of contemporary Christianity makes a profound error because we try to comfort people with this cultural understanding of heaven rather than a biblical understanding of our Savior. And so in my pastoral years, I, I've done plenty of funerals. I, have, I was a hospital chaplain before that. Like I have been with people who are grieving mm-hmm. and in pain and, and are full of either anger or just distraught over what has happened to them or their loved one. And the hope I want to give to them is a God who is ever present with them, who will never let them or their loved one go, even in mm-hmm. death. And that we can be assured of his goodness because he's proven it by going to the cross and his power he's proven by rising from the dead. That is our hope. And heaven is not the bullseye here. So, and to be just theological about it, this idea of what theologians call the intermediate state, which Mm -hmm. is what is it that happens to the believer between their physical death and their future resurrection, scripture has almost nothing to say about it. Yeah. Other than that, to be away from the body is to be with the Lord. Yeah. But it doesn't give any greater detail than that. And I think that's a clue mm-hmm. that our emphasis is not supposed to be on all this, you know, geography of heaven and all the, you know, heaven tourism nonsense that comes out in books and videos and stuff. That's just not what scripture emphasizes. And when we do emphasize that, we are taking energy and time and imagination away from what scripture does emphasize which is Jesus himself. I want to make sure we get to a question that, again, I think we have talked about this a little bit on the podcast before, but I don't know that we've ever had the time or space to really actually work out why this is true biblically. Um, I feel like we throw a lot of shade at the idea that, like, it's all going to burn. Like, we're Mm -hmm. all just waiting for Earth to be burned up. And you have a section talking about where we get that, which is primarily in 2 Peter. And I do think it's a challenging passage. I've had conversations with people where I try and say, well, really the focus is not on heaven. The focus really is on new heavens and new earth, the resurrection of our bodies, redemption of all creation. But then they go to this passage. And and I feel like even though I have like thought about it a lot and read a lot of smart people about it, talking to an actual person about it, it is really hard to overcome Mm -hmm. their sense that looking at these words, it says the earth will be consumed by fire. That seems pretty straightforward to me. That's the end. Why is that not a good interpretation of that passage? And then also maybe like, why is it important that we get that right? Because people could also, again, like all of these things say, I don't know, I think Sky just has like a different theological position on this, but I don't know how much it really matters. Yeah. Okay, let's start with the second part first. Um, We have always believed as Christians, going all the way back, that what lasts for eternity is what matters most. This is why Jesus says, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither rust nor moth will destroy, right? It's the eternal things that matter more than the temporal things. So the question we need to ask is, well, what's eternal? What's going to last forever? Um, And one of the popular teachings, or at least over the last 150 years or so in the West, has been the physical universe, the earth, is not eternal. It's Mm -hmm. temporary. Therefore, it doesn't matter. And that going even further back, is really deeply influenced by Pluto and, and Greek philosophy and Gnosticism, which says the material world is is inherently evil and unredeemable and God doesn't care about it. And it's only the non-material, the spiritual that matters. That's a Greek import from philosophy. It's not inherent to Christianity or Judaism before it. So therefore, if you've been enculturated by that assumption and you read Second Peter 3 or some other text, you just immediately assume, oh yeah, this is the speaking about the world being destroyed, so it doesn't matter, and therefore it doesn't, shouldn't be part of what Christians care about. So that's why it matters. We need to define what's eternal and what, what's really going on here. But then more specifically to this idea of the earth and Second Peter 3, um, I, I, this is going to sound cheesy, but people should pick up the book and read that chapter because <laughs> there's so many pieces that's really important to get into we don't have time yeah. for. But one of the two big takeaways, one is in that chapter, Peter's entire argumentation is comparing the judgment to come with the judgment that happened back in the flood in Genesis. Mm-hmm. And he says, just as the world was destroyed by water, during the flood, so the earth will be destroyed by fire. Well, what 
that word destroyed is carrying a lot of weight there. And when you go back and interpret Genesis and the flood, was the world physically, materially destroyed and replaced? Did God actually obliterate the existing earth and make a brand new one? No. Mm -hmm. I don't know a single theologian that interprets Genesis that way. The way most interpret it is the floodwaters came and it it wiped out the world, I'm using air quotes, meaning the systems of the world, the, the depravity and evil that had infected the world and preserved only Noah and his family, but washed away and wiped away all of the evil that had been built up. And then the earth was renewed. It was a reset button, a starting over. So when Peter talks about the next judgment coming by fire to destroy the world, it's not the physical destruction of the actual planet and mm -hmm. replacing of it, but like the waters of Noah and the flood, the fire will purify and purge away the evil systems of the world and the people and all the, the depravity that has infected the world and renew it. Um, and there's a lot more in the text which makes mm -hmm. clear that the, the emphasis is not on destruction, but on purification. And the fire is meant to reveal. I mean, in one section, right after talking about the destruction of the world, Peter then says, and, it, and the world will be revealed, meaning uncovered, exposed. So th there's a lot of assumptions that we carry into that text that are dangerous. And then one last thing, and th I don't want to emphasize this too much because it can be abused, but there's different words for new in Greek. Mm. There's one that means new in time or young, and then there's another that carries the nuance of new in quality. And when Peter talks about the new earth, or when John talks about the new heavens and new earth in Revelation, they use the Greek word meaning new in quality. So we shouldn't assume it means the old earth and, and heaven have been utterly materially destroyed and a brand new earth was created. We should interpret it to mean just as I'm a new creation in Christ, and the old has passed away and the new has come, Paul says, so the new earth is a new in quality. Um, it's, it's hitting the reset button and saying all mm -hmm. that was broken and wrong has been done away with, and now things are as they should be. You said something earlier about the, the, not, the already and the not yet, and you have a whole bunch of portions of the book that are about kind of what do, what does Jesus saying about the kingdom of heaven mean for us? What, how do we seek the kingdom of heaven? How do we respond to how he describes the kingdom of heaven and, and create that in our own context? And this is all connected to this, like, we're not just awaiting to be plucked out of here. Like, what really matters is that heaven is among us, and Jesus identifies that, and how do we respond? And I feel like there's a difficult tension for a lot of people in their communities and their families and their churches of of the already and the not yet, of on one hand going, okay, I hear you and I don't want to fall into this kind of escapist mentality or focus too much on heaven instead of on Jesus. I want to seek the kingdom of heaven in my context and do good work that will continue into eternity. On the other hand, I've seen the the bad results of people thinking that they can create heaven on earth themselves mm -hmm. and maybe it's an over like the theological term an over-realized eschatology we have too much that we think we're really creating here and now and it actually can cause us to justify a lot of of wrong because we're right. the ones creating it um how would you describe that balance or how do we know that we're kind of hitting that because you give all these descriptions of of how jesus's parables relate to us what does this demand of us or mean for us how would we respond to that in a way that keeps that tension alive instead of, I think the human tendency, most of us, is to pick one or the other. So we're either just escapist or we're creating heaven on earth ourselves. What does keeping that tension look like? Yeah, there's a bunch of different parables and, and teachings of Jesus in the Gospels that, that get at this already not yet kind of thing. One that stands out is the parable of the wheat and the weeds, where he talks about a man sowing wheat in his field and then his enemy comes along and sows a bunch of weeds and they grow up together and the servants say hey we got to get rid of all these weeds in other words we need to pluck out all the evil in the world and the master goes no 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 no, because if you do that you're going to pull up a bunch of the wheat also mm. so just let them grow side by side and at the end we'll separate we'll harvest it all and we'll separate the wheat from the weeds and he directly applies this to the end of the age when the angels will come and, you know, harvest everything and separate the two. And, and there's an understanding there that, you know, the kingdom is planted now. It's growing among us. There are good, wonderful things happening mm -hmm. in this world. There is justice and healing and reconciliation and forgiveness and all the other things that are marks of his kingdom. 
And right beside it, there continues to be depravity and evil and dehumanization and slavery and injustice and all kinds of wickedness. And they're going to exist side by side. And we continue in our faithfulness to see God's will done on earth as it is in heaven, but we shouldn't have this utopian belief that we possess in ourselves the power to extract all the evil in the world. That is yet to be done, and it is ultimately God's prerogative. We resist it, we combat it, as Christ has equipped us and, and, and called us to, but we can't fall into this utopian trap of thinking we can we can do it. We can make the world into yeah. heaven on as he... And so that prevents us from having too grandiose a view of our own yeah. capabilities. And it does then fill us with hope that I will continue to cultivate heaven here to the degree I can, but I still long for the coming of Christ when yeah. finally his goodness will be revealed to all. That which is evil will be purged away and he will be all in all. Like we still have that eschatological hope. So that's the already not yet. And yeah. at the very end, Jesus says to his disciples, in this world, you're going to have a lot of trouble. Mm -hmm. You're going to face a lot of tribulation. But be of good strength and courage because I have overcome the world. Like, we're going to go through this together. I'm yeah. with you until the end. And that's where we find our hope, not in our actual ability to make the world what we want it to be. I think that's a great place to end. Thanks, Guy. I really do highly recommend this book. I have not actually gotten to see the pictures yet, so I'm a little oh. bit awaiting, like we are awaiting Christ's return. I am <laughs> awaiting to see the pictures in Sky's book, but the words are great, and I assume the pictures are also wonderful. Oh, they're fantastic. And that's something people should be aware of if they've been listening yeah. to this. And, oh, this is too much theology. This is too deep. And these, every chapter is like two to three pages and includes a doodle. This is meant to be yep, super yep. accessible. It totally is. This is this is like you trying to teach five year olds. I'm trying to teach yep. ordinary people yep. good theology with doodles. So I hope people will find it accessible. Thank you, yeah. Caitlin. Yeah, and and helpful for talking to people about this. Like we've been saying, it it might be challenging to bring up this kind of these kinds of topics with people, and this is a great accessible way to do it that doesn't just like put a big theology book on their table, but helps you really go back to scripture and and return to Jesus. So thanks, Guy. The Holy Post Podcast is a production of Holy Post Media. Production assistance by Mike Stralo. Editing by Area Code Audio. Help us create more thoughtful Christian media by subscribing to Holy Post Plus at holypost.com slash plus. Also, be sure to leave a review on Apple Podcasts so more people can discover thoughtful Christian commentary plus ukulele and occasional butt news. Visit holypost.com for show notes, news stories, Holy Post merchandise, and much more.